So welcome everyone to SDB Award Lectures Part 2. I am Nicole Theodosio, and as Chair of Professional Development and Education Committee, it is my biggest honor to introduce the winner of the Victor Hamburger Prize at the annual meeting. The Victor Hamburger Prize for Education recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to education and developmental biology or related fields. I'm thrilled to introduce this year's speaker, Dr. Michael Baresi. Dr. Baresi is a professor of biological sciences and neuroscience at Smith College. And in 2015, he made one of his biggest commitments of his career. He began his collaboration with Scott Gilbert on the seminal textbook, Developmental Biology. Scott at the time was looking for someone to revolutionize the textbook and Michael more than delivered. He reintroduced plant development, integrating plants in all the relevant chapters, upgraded and expanded content, and reconfigured the textbook, introducing online tutorials and his bioweb conferences where students interviewed scientists. If re revolutionizing the field's religious textbook wasn't enough, and I forgot to advance my slides, so one minute, there we are. There is Michael with his um, new ed newest edition of Developmental Biology and his award. Um, if revolutionizing the field's religious textbook wasn't enough, Michael answered the call for so many educators during the pandemic with a frantic switch from in-person to online teaching and learning. Michael's emergency, how the hell are we gonna pull off this Zoom thing inspired many around the world kept us sane and demonstrated how we can shift to remote learning and keep our students engaged. Michael provided a platform for us to come together as a community and generously shared his teaching materials. To quote one of his nominees, Michael showed us what was possible and assured us that we could do this and do it well. It helped sustain developmental biology teaching at a precarious time. Michael stepped up and emerged as a thoughtful and supportive leader in the developmental biology community. Dr. Baresi has truly elevated the field of developmental biology. He never stops trying out new ideas to engage and empower his students. And his vision for all, in his words, is, quote, to encourage the development of lifelong scientific learners through an engaging student-centered investigation and problem-solving curriculum. It is my honor to award Dr. Baresi the Victor Hamburger Outstanding Educator Prize. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you very much, Nicole. Let me just share my screen. Uh, just verify. Yes. Okay. Nicole, thank you so much. That was an absolutely wonderful introduction. And uh, it's actually a really great honor for you to introduce me um, as a friend and colleague that over the years, you yourself have been a champion of uh, developmental biology education. Um, you know, so thank you. It means a lot uh, uh, to have you introduce me. And really it's a, it's a privilege, honestly, to be receiving this award at a day when so many of my heroes are also receiving awards. So congratulations um, to all the award recipients. Um, but this award for me means a lot. Um, it really is honestly the most honorable award that I could possibly uh, hope to ever, ever get. So um, thank you so much. And, and I've tried to think about like, what am I going to <laughs> talk about today? Um, and this past year has certainly shaped a lot of what we think and how we teach. So I want to start off with a little bit of an understanding of a renewed kind of pedagogical philosophy that I feel like we've, we've learned over the past year. Um, and then showcase some of the initiatives that I think contributed to this award that hopefully leads to perhaps a little bit of, of inspiration for some of you educators out there. Um, and then, of course, to give thanks. And, and I'd like to start with kind of giving thanks. First, my nominators, I know at least a couple of you and, uh, you know, from the bottom of my ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that's where gratitude comes from. Um, thanks so much. It really means a lot to me. Uh, to the Society for Developmental Biology, you know, Ida, 
current and past presidents, uh, the whole committee on education. I wanna thank you all for continually supporting education. The presence of this award is just a significant recognition of what and how the, the society feels about, about teaching. And so thank you so much for that support. To the hundreds of students that have directly mentored and been part of my research lab, to the over 2000 students that I've taught, the tens of thousands of students associated with, uh, you know, reading the developmental biology textbook, to my own teachers, mentors, collaborators in and out of this society, you know, thank you so much for being part of the journey and giving me the necessary growth factors and feedback loops that I needed in order to develop as an educator. But I'd be, of course, remiss not to thank my own family. I think all of us know, uh, you know, this career can't be done alone. Uh, there's a lot of sacrifices that have been made, and my wife Heather, Sam, Jonah, Luca, Mateo, you know, love you all. Thank you for the support. My extended family, I'm the youngest of seven siblings. I've had a lot, a lot of support from my parents and in-laws. I, I really couldn't have done it, uh, you know, without all of you. So thank you so much. One last thanks, though, and a really important one is to, you know, Think about the recipients that have received this award before. And if we start with Victor Hamburger, who has literally the quote that is my most favorite quote in the world, our real teacher has been and still is the embryo who is incidentally the only teacher who is always right. Now, that quote is really directly driving home this philosophy of merging experimental embryology and education together. He set that way back when, the merging of those two ideals. And if you look at past recipients, there are many that have continued to push forward that sort of philosophy and have been recognized for it. Moreover, you know, the very first award went to my friend and collaborator, Scott Gilbert, uh, for the first sort of curriculum creation with the introductions of the of developmental biology, the textbook, which was followed by many more. Um, very important resources that came about to, again, start to build the content that makes our field. Um, Bill Wood pushed active learning pedagogies in the classroom and, and encouraged that in others through outreach activities, for which many others participated in outreach um, to really broaden developmental biology to secondary education and important advocacies. Um, Dr. Habrowski, thankfully, was recognized very importantly for his work in moving STEM in a more inclusive way. Um, and I'm really glad that he was recognized for that. Sean Carroll really, I think, exemplified bringing very complicated developmental biology to a much broader audience in terms of um, his ability for, through science communication. Uh, last year, Joe Handelsman, I mean, she sort of does it all, outreach, science communication, and a great example of that merging of research and teaching. But then of course there's Ida, who has just done it all for many, many years. And uh, I'm glad that she was recognized for her supports of education. And then there's me. Um, you know, if I think about all of these individuals, I don't think in any one of those categories I match up. But I have sort of salt and peppered all of them. And that's what I wanna kind of talk to you about today is these four major areas. Um, merging that research and teaching, curriculum creation, community outreach, and science communication. But I wanna start with really thinking about what is the guiding philosophy of our teaching and learning? And can we do it in a way that it's, you know, really surrounded by inclusion and has a sort of grounding foundation in a growth mindset? What would that philosophy be? Well, firstly, all of these sections, it's important to understand that we can't keep them as separate things and they need to bleed together, right? Keeping them separate is really not sustainable for any one of us. Um, and if we can merge and develop efficiencies across these lines, then a lot can get done. And this past year, you know, has really informed what sort of philosophies I think about that coronavirus. And the one major thing that has come out of it for me has been the idea of empathy. And empathy really needs to be at the heart of, I think, all of our course creation. Um, and you know, we had to really think hard about the differences that our students were experiencing, the different learning environments and the stresses that they were having. 
And we could sort of feel it ourselves, right? With everything we were going through, which to me really drove home what empathy was and how it can inform our teaching. But I think we need to hear from a student to really understand this properly. And let me introduce Shay Iyer. And I believe that empathy must be at the forefront of every educative endeavor, period, end of sentence. <laughs> Education drives society forward. Um, and that can't be done unless we're considering every person in the room um, and how they interact with the material. So empathy needs to guide every project you do, every um, assignment you pose, every deadline you grant, <laughs> every student who you think this is a hopeless case, right? They're not doing the work, they're not showing up to class. Why? What is that student experiencing that that is putting them in such a tough, tough position that they can't commit to one of their primary commitments in life at this stage. So thank you, Shay. Shay was a student in one of my courses this past year. Um, and you know, I really appreciate her sharing her thoughts, which drive home the fact that everyone is, you know, always experiencing a diversity of stressors. And we really need to design our courses with genuine empathy in mind. Um, and we can think about sort of the key aspects of course design. There's only two that I'm going to be able to talk to you about today. One is, you know, really driving home that growth mindset and then also universal access. And I've chosen these two because they're the two that directly inform really an inclusive, um, good inclusive practices um, moving forward. And I'm going to highlight several student voices. And I think it's important we're talking about teaching. We are teaching students, how are they learning? We need to listen to them. And our student body changes yearly. I mean, we only have to look at ourselves to kind of understand that, right? Here's me at a high school prom. College years, you know, yikes. Here I started graduate school, all right, I got it going on. And then mm, trying to finish grad school, you know, grad school does things to you, it does. And then wedding day, I sort of got cleaned up. Then I entered a postdoc, who knows? where I went, emerged out of the lab, started my own research, my own lab at Smith College, and then ultimately father of boys, four boys, submitting my tenure dossier, seemed to have it together. Of course, after you get tenure, who cares what you look like at that point? And then full professor, got to grow a full beard, and then pandemic professor, my beard just gets longer. My point is, is that we change. Everybody's changing all the time, and we have to listen to our students. So in the remainder of today's talk, we are going to hear from students. And I wanna talk about the growth mindset. This was work um, developed by Carol DeWick, who really researched the growth versus fixed mindset. And, you know, over the past year, what matters, right? We had to ask ourselves, what really matters? And as we've all kind of known, it's not so much the grade, it's our students learning in the end, right? So I'm gonna ask you all, like, do you welcome opportunities for experimentation when it comes to learning in your class? Such that there's little cost, right, for failure while improvement is somehow rewarded. My solution is gonna be to suggest that you consider standards-based grading. That is something that is actually developed in, in grade school um, and offer multiple opportunities to grow. I think Akila highlights this really well in experience she had in my course. Well, your class was the very first class that I've ever had where we had multiple attempts on assignments. And I think it's been my favorite part of this class because I know my first grades, I was like, ooh, struggling. <laughs> and it's allowed me to be like more reflective and like, okay, this is what I don't know. And this is where I can improve on for the next attempt. And I think it also takes the pressure off of assessments because you have like, you know that you have another attempt to approve it to improve so even if you know like okay maybe i didn't study as hard for this first attempt um maybe there are details that are lacking but i know i have another attempt to redeem myself and i think it takes away the um the kind of like the aspect of, that i see in a lot of like weed out classes like it's either you get it or you don't and that's really not how education works like i think that a lot of people have room to improve and having multiple attempts on assignments is something that has highlighted that for me like i know for example um with the most recent dev i reread my first one and i was like okay now i see why i got this grade and now i see where i can improve um so i think it has helped a lot and like also i've been able to 
go back and like learn more about the things that I was confused about. I can come to you with questions. I can talk to other people in the class. And it's also like, it just set up a, a very healthy learning environment where you know that even though I didn't get it this first time, I can always try again and do even better. So I think that's been very helpful this semester. After all, we are researchers, right? It's in the name. We go into lab, we mess up, we redo it, we learn, we grow. Why can't we do that in the classroom? So I really want to emphasize this, that whatever course you put together, try to think about it from a growth mindset. <clears throat> the other aspect is universal access. And, you know, past year, nobody had the same kind of access, right? Variable internets, different time zones. It was, it was a, a mess. Um, but that we should learn from and try to create courses that ultimately everybody gets a special accommodation. Zoe Gardner here speaks really eloquently about it. There is literally nothing more important in higher ed right now in terms of just creating an accessible environment for everyone because it's not just about students with disabilities, it's about literally all students because accommodations benefit everyone universally because everyone brings something different to the table and you don't wanna shut students out because they feel like they can't succeed because those are the students that are often bringing the most to the table because they're not the traditional students who all have the same background and the same opinions. You know, accommodations are this thing that people have so much shame around. You know, I don't wanna ask my professor because then they'll think that I'm dumb or that I'm at a disadvantage or that, I don't want to try as hard in their class. I'm like, that's not true. You know, So many people need a little bit of leveling out of the playing field. And all that accommodations do is acknowledge that nobody is starting on a level playing field. You know, if I can't inspire you to do certain things, I really think my students are absolutely amazing. And I thank them so much for, for sharing their, their ideas on, on these thoughts. But that brings us to um, you know, these four major categories. And now that we have an understanding of the importance of empathy, how to build an inclusive um, uh, kind of course design and the growth mindset, I wanna talk a little bit about merging research and teaching and specifically my work on course-based research experiences. So what we're talking about here is that traditionally when you go to teach a lab course, um, you kind of have your teaching over there, but then you have your research lab in a separate sort of entity of life. And, you know, for years we've been doing this and certainly students graduate and all, but are we really preparing them to solve problems later? Can we merge these two things directly, even tap into real world problems that students care about to increase the kind of problem solving abilities that they have? And this can even feed back to actually continue to support your research better. Now, from a practical standpoint, you know, we're kind of like this beetle getting pulled in a thousand different directions. The more that we can overlap what we do, uh, we'll improve our efficiency and, uh, and, and I think help improve our lives. Um, and the other aspect about course-based research is that we are harnessing the thing that we all like to do. We are in research. Remember being on that microscope, seeing that thing for the first time? You're the only one in the world that sees that that act of discovery is what excites us. And, and we can leverage that for student learning. But all students really ultimately need slash want this experience. Introducing it into our courses is one way to start to get it to more to the masses. And it's just a lot of fun, right? If you're excited, they're excited. So what are some essential ingredients if you're going to go think about kind of doing a, a cure or course-based research experience? One is you got to have your learning objectives, content research, perhaps an accessible model, mind zebrafish. A novel question is super important, right? We've looked at um, human development, bioelectrics, and, and the um, aspects of, of pollution on development. Um, what is your infrastructure? Do you have people power and, and some important tools? And then how is there What's the end goal? Is there a product being produced, perhaps a, a poster or symposium that students can, can present in? You take that course and use it as an incubator for your own ideas. There's so many cool things that we've discovered in this course that have then gone on and continued in our research lab. It's just been an absolute blast. One, one example is the Deepwater Horizon spill 
when this occurred, literally two weeks before I started my course, I came up with the idea of, can I get my hands on this oil? And can the students in this course actually do some of the testing? Well, there was actually formal channels. And as it was being sampled, I got that oil. We learned the chemistry to do water accumulated fractions and tested that on zebrafish development, found a variety of specific phenotypes. And those students, in fact, turned it around over successive um, iterations and fueling some special studies on his theses. And we were able to publish this work. But it all began in that course-based research. Here's Katrina Anderson talking about what was the impact of being a student in that research course? I can honestly say that like the moment that I was told about this research course is probably one of the like pivoting points of my life um, where I can see that so many things came from participating in this course. The people I met, the experiences I had, the empowerment that I felt as someone who, um, again, was 19 years old, but was given the um, power and authority to, to do real research. Um, that really informed my entire undergraduate career, I would say. And how important is it that you have a novel question, you know, one that's potentially, you know, relevant to students? I think that was the, the key element. Um, we had a problem that was relevant both scientifically, culturally, um, societally. So feeling like we were tackling something that actually meant something um, was really important for that initial buy-in um, and allowed us to sort of struggle through some of the more difficult times knowing that we were actually doing something that that was relevant and particularly the opportunity to present at a conference at the end of our experience really solidified that we weren't just fooling around in a lab this was work that was potentially meaningful not only to us but to the outside scientific community but we have to develop some curriculum right we have to have those resources available. So as um, you know, Nicole mentioned, of course, the developmental biology textbook. And then I wanna also talk about bioweb conferences and developmental documentaries. So the textbook, uh, you know, I can't thank Scott Gilbert enough for really bringing me in. Um, he's been an amazing collaborator. And I think we've pushed these past two editions to, to new heights, um, really trying to continue that major philosophy. He started with bringing in and including data and it trying to explain the whys behind what we are, 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 the story we're telling. Hopefully our writing and visuals are engaging. It helps that I'm a, um, you know, illustrator myself. So I'm able to really try to think about and conceptualize visually the complex problems of developmental biology, which has been just an absolute blast. Um, you know, and so thank you uh, again, Scott, for, for giving me that opportunity. I'm also trying to push really hard though, at increasing the access that students see through this textbook as launch pads into the research. So there's many opportunities for that to occur. Moreover, I really wanna make it easier for you, the professor, to actually use this content and to administer more active learning pedagogies in the classroom, hence through the dev tutorials and the active learning case studies that we're doing. And this will continue more and more with additions to come. But a lot started with my use of and creation of these bioweb conferences. And so you might have a typical learning objectives of your course. You know, what are the concepts? What do you want to improve science communication, develop those critical thinking skills? But this last one here, I wanted to try to provide a learning environment that helps students feel like they are intellectual collaborators in the field rather than just bystanders peering in. That's actually pretty hard to do. And a while back, I was goofing around. Dad, why are you coming home? I'm gonna come home soon, bud. Dad, my hand's gone. Where'd your hand go? I don't know. I hope you're actually laughing wherever you are at certain times of this. It's really hard not seeing everybody to get the reaction, but I can laugh at myself, I guess. But nonetheless, that technology gave me the idea 
uh, that perhaps I can utilize web conferencing to bring investigators into the classroom. And hopefully if we're doing our jobs right, right, students are asking questions that perhaps you can't answer, but maybe the lead investigator can. Special thanks to Cliff Taven, who was the very first web conference I did. I never had a conversation with him before, but he said yes. And more so, he loved the experience so much that uh, in cooperation with the Revson Foundation, actually gave me a, a very, you know, a small grant, but a pilot grant that got the whole thing going. Um, so, you know, Cliff, thank you so much for your, for your early year support. And that gave birth to well over well over 60 web conferences that are freely available on the website, on my website. Um, and I just have to give a big shout out to all of the investigators that have said yes over the years. It's been an absolute blast getting a chance to talk to you and uh, introduce you to my students um, and allow my students to interact with you. Uh, really valuable time that you've given and I can't thank you enough. And of course, actually playing with web conferencing somehow magically prepared me for the pandemic that hit us last year quite well. Uh, but let's hear from uh, Ivanka. 10 years ago was at Smith taking a course. It was a really good window into what science is like beyond the publication. You know, we heard from several people, I think it was Davy Van Bachter's session where he was talking about some experimental, um, you know, mishap that happened and, uh, you know, talked about sort of how they had to overcome that to get to the actual data, to get that during the revisions. And it sort of, you know, really humanized the whole process for me. And it, I realized that it's not this, you know, sterile activity that always goes to plan or element of luck. Um, that came into it and, you know, the drama, if you will, of it really uh, came through when we were talking to these PIs. Can I just say that was 10 years ago? And Ivanka actually remembers the conference, the name of the investigator, that experience. It's creating those opportunities where you have a memorable experience that uh, is really important for that long-term retention, um, you know, and, and it just makes it so much fun. And we extended those web conferences into an idea of, can I have students engage even more with the material and the outer world and really have to integrate it all together to make a movie, right? So could it be possible that I can have students take ownership, right? Do the writing, producing, directing, actually decide what content is necessary for that to communicate a given story um, and interact directly with that talent. And of course, in this case, the topic and the content is developmental biology. And through seminar courses where we've done this, uh, we've now made uh, many um, short documentaries, mostly on stem cells, but also the evolution and development. And I'm super happy to say that very soon we're going to have a full length documentary, five chapters, all on regeneration. Um, and, you know, the we're doing this in the course, there are benefits for those students, but we're producing products at the end that can benefit everybody else. And that has a feedback on their motivation to do well and learn what they're doing. Um, let's hear from Carla Velez. So making those documentaries was incredibly intimidating, right? I feel like it, it took all of, of, of the idea of the web conferences, right? And, and having to meet with these scientists and coming up with the questions. But you also had to take all that information, interpret it and find a way to deliver it in a way that's approachable for everyone, that's um, accurate, right? And, and that it's fun. So, so I feel like the whole process was incredibly intimidating, but I also learned so much from that process. Um, because you're forced to do it, right? It, it, it's like taking you out of your comfort zone, challenging you, but then it also is a big confidence boost at the end when you have this product that you're proud of and, and you get to show off to the world. Um, so, so yeah, I think it was, it was a very interesting and valuable learning experience. She sums it up well. <clears throat> um, I know I'm getting short on time, uh, but there's just, uh, you know, one quick major program that I want to, you know, emphasize because the importance of scientists getting out there and not just communicating through perhaps products their students make, but more directly interacting with the community 
And one program is the student scientist program that we created, which um, I, I think Nicole, you actually quoted this, which is you know to encourage that development of those lifelong scientific learners um, through this investigative curriculum. And that's what this program does. And we use Zebrafish with create these week long programs, but working really directly with teachers. Um, and we've been able to work with nine different districts, you know, over 3,000 students um, uh, supported by several different sources, uh, but it's been an amazing program. And this is just my lab, a team in my lab doing this. Um, and that's important because I really want you all out there to think about what can you do from your own lab? And, and I believe my program is portable uh, to anyone's lab. Right? And it's based on this sort of true foundation. So you focus on teacher training, get them competent so it's a sustainable program. It's research focused because students need to generate that sort of uh, reasoning skills. Use accessible and innovative methodologies, right? Students learn by doing. And in that way, they're going to be excited, right? So Stephanie Cohen asks, how did this program impact the students? This undergraduate experience, it really showed me the value of like experimental design and investigative curriculum. It showed me the value of those core concepts that make up the student scientist outreach program in students learning. It's essential in exciting students' passion about STEM and also effectively communicating the essential scientific concepts. So. I had students who would never stay after school in the classroom, come after school just to look at the embryos, to take care of the embryos, um, to use the microscopes. Uh, you heard conversations between students about different experiments that they could develop using embryos, like what could we use these for? What could we explore with these tools, with these organisms? And that kind of thinking, it's so hard to get from students, but just that small experience. We only did a week and even after a day they were thinking that way and speaking that way to each other. So and Carla, how did it impact I you? mean it's a reason why I became a teacher. Right? I she goes on, but in the interest of time, uh she is now a teacher um in Springfield, Massachusetts, doing an amazing job and we're still collaborating uh with her to carry out that outreach. And and you know lastly um as Nicole mentioned uh, the idea of these Zoom forums was an amazing silver lining over the past year. Uh, there were challenges this past year, but it brought our community together. Um, and these are going to be happening bi-monthly, and I'm going to continue them in the fall. So I want to thank everyone who participated. I learned so much from you, um, and uh, we really learned so much from each other and strengthened our community in the process. So please look out for communications about that. Um, and don't forget for your own sanity, please blur these lines for efficiency and do everything you're gonna be building with empathy. I wanna thank all those students who shared their thoughts with us. Um, I wanna thank Kate Lee, who, who's really collaborating on, on the techn technological side, my lab past and present. I uh, can't thank you all enough for your support, um, particularly um, Naren Pathak and, and Alicia, technician and a research scientist in the lab. Naren has also really been a um, co-teacher in some of those course-based research experiences. So thank you both. Um, extreme gratitude to the funding that has supported these initiatives, NSF, NIH, Revson, Arnold Mabel, Mabel Beckman Foundation and Smith College, um, as well as to the Center for Community Outreach for supporting the Student Science Program. So thank you all. Uh, sorry I went a little over, I really appreciate it. This award means everything uh, to me and uh, and I'm not going away, so there'll be more to come.